All right, welcome to day two of States of Matter, and we are going to look at the nature of liquids. Um, so yesterday we talked about gases, and we were we weren't super super specific about gases, but we did talk about some finer points of gases. We're going to do the same thing with liquids today. Um, so, question: How hot should water be when you make coffee? Obviously, you want to get it hot enough, right? so that we can vaporize the oils in the coffee beans. Because if we don't do that, you won't get all the flavor in your coffee. And I, I definitely like my coffee black. And I know that if I don't get my coffee hot, I can't get the oils in. I can't get the flavors that I want. Um, why that's important is that if you make coffee in cold water, obviously it wouldn't work out and you wouldn't get as much out of it and you wouldn't get the taste that I desire. So temperature of what liquid is important when making coffee. And it's because we want to vaporize the oils. Um, what factors determine the physical properties of a liquid? So here's the first one. Substances that can flow are fluids. Okay, Liquids and gases are considered fluids. Now the difference between liquids and, and, glass, and gases is that liquids and gases, I guess what's common about them is that they conform to the shape of their container. And you can see in both those situations, a liquid and gas both takes the side shape of its container. But there's a key difference. There are no attractions in a gas, according to the kinetic theory that we discussed yesterday. But particles in a liquid are attracted to each other. These attractions keep the particles close together. So liquids have what's known as a definite volume. Gases do not. They take the volume of their container. Liquids have a definite volume. So these particles all right, determines the properties that we find in liquids. So what are some properties? One, liquids much more dense than gases. All right. um, if we increase the pressure on a liquid, we really don't affect its volume very much. All right. Same is true as solids. So liquids and solids are known as condensed state of matter because they're, they're much more dense. Right? Condensed, much more dense states of matter. Um, how are liquids and gases similar and one way that they are different? That actually was something you should be able to do. So here's an example. Both liquids and gases can flow. They're fluids. So they can take the shape of their container. The molecules of the liquid have attractions that are not present in gases. Okay, so gases don't have attractions. Therefore, liquids, definite volume, okay, and will simply will not simply fill their container, which is interesting because in a liquid in a gas, they don't they have to take the volume of their container. Um, evaporation. So what's the relationship between evaporation and kinetic energy? Um, so when we take a when we take a liquid to a gas, all right, any liquid to a gas, the process is called vaporizing the gas, liquid into a gas. Now, this conversion occurs at the surface. When it is not boiling, we don't call it vaporization. We call it evaporation. So the difference between evaporation and vaporization, vaporization is all the times when a liquid becomes a gas. Evaporation is only when it's at the surface and when it is not boiling. So evaporation is a specific form of vaporization. Um, so evaporation has a different outcome when we talk about an open system as opposed to that of a closed system. All right. In an open system, molecules evaporate and escape. Okay, that's how we that's how puddles disappear after we have uh, rain. If we have a closed system where we can't what they do is we start to get this process of these water molecules evaporating and then coming back into liquid. So some condense back. This leads us to something pretty important, is that there's something called vapor pressure that we'll get to. But during evaporation, only those molecules with enough energy can escape, right? They have to have this certain minimum energy, kinetic energy to escape the surface of a liquid. So some of the particles do escape, but then as they escape, they actually collide with particles that are above and bounce back down. So if we want to evaporate a liquid faster, obviously we heat it. When we heat it, what happens? Well, we increase the average kinetic energy of the particles. This energy allows more particles right, to overcome the attractive forces of the liquid state and evaporate up. Okay, So evaporation happens faster when heated due to the kinetic theory. As evaporation occurs, the particles with the highest kinetic energy escape first. All right? Particles left in the liquid, so those particles that are left in the liquid, have less kinetic energy than those that had escaped. 
as evaporation takes place, the liquid's temperature decreases, okay? Because the higher energy piece, parts, particles leave. That's an, this is an important thing. Evaporation is a cooling process, okay? It's a cooling process. Think about when you sweat. You sweat to cool, and what cools you off is when the sweat evaporates off of your body. Evaporation is a cooling process. So, and here's the example. So on hot days, when you perspire, water on your, on your, uh, from your uh, sweat absorb heat from your body and evaporate from the skin surface. As evaporation leaves you cooler. So by sweating, we remain cool, okay, by having the liquid that we put out absorb our body heat. So that's what, how sweat works, and that's evaporative process, which is a cooling process. Now, why heating a liquid causes evaporation to occur faster? It's because evaporation occurs when particles have enough kinetic energy to overcome the forces holding them together. So if you heat a liquid, you increase the energy, you increase the energy, the particles leave. They, they won't be held together by those attractive forces between the liquid particles. Um, so, term vapor pressure. When can a dynamic equilibrium exist? All right, so this is an interesting word, dynamic equilibrium. Um, so the evaporation of a liquid in a closed system differs from an open system, and we looked at that diagram earlier. When a, when a liquid is sealed, the particles start to vaporize, right? They get, they get enough kinetic energy to go and become a gas, but then when they hit the sides of the container, they lose some energy, okay, and they can come back. But in the process of colliding, they make pressure, right, because pressure is caused by collisions. So the measure of the force that this gas hits the container with is called vapor pressure. And that's an important term when we talk about boiling, vapor pressure. So that's the pressure of the gas above a liquid. Um, over time, particles enter vapor, right, and then some return back down to liquid state, and we get this constant equilibrium occurring where we have liquid evaporating to vapor, vapor condensing back to liquid, and this process goes over and over and over with these particles. Soon, the particles condensing will equal the particles vaporizing. So we'll, we'll get an equal number of particles, okay? So liquids and vapor will have equal number of particles above the liquid and inside the liquid. Important point. When we have constant vapor pressure, this is what a dynamic equilibrium is, okay, where things are switching vapor to liquid, liquid to vapor, and this constant change, though, keeps the number of liquid and vapor the same. So the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. At equilibrium, the particles, they continue to evaporate and condense, but no net change occurs. So if two, if two molecules uh, evaporate, two more must condense. That's what dynamic equilibrium is. So, to make the best tasting coffee, many people grind the coffee beans just prior to brewing. Also, they are careful not to grind the coffee beans too much. Explain how both of these methods help prevent the natural oils and coffee beans from vaporizing. Okay, so here's the reason why. The natural oils can vaporize only from the surface of the coffee bean. So, grinding it, grinding it small, right, this prevents vaporization. Also, not grinding beans too much keeps the surface uh, lower and gives less area for vaporization. Either way, you can get those beans to sign to take their time and get the oils out. All right, vapor pressure and temperature change. Increase in the temperature of a liquid increases vapor pressure. So if we have a contained liquid, liquid in a container, and we heat it up, all right, we put a little flame underneath, what we're going to do is we're going to increase vapor pressure because more of the gas is going to be formed, which leads to more collisions. And since they're hot, they're going to provide more, more power, right? So the particles in the warm liquid have increased kinetic energy, all right? And since they have the increased kinetic energy, they will collide more often. So vapor pressure data... And, and here's how a liquid. So we're going to look at uh, three different substances, water, ethanol, and diethyl ether. Um, don't concern yourself about what those are. Okay. But when we look at them, at zero degrees Celsius, there's a vapor pressure, right? And then we see the difference in vapor pressure from zero to 100. And you can see during this process that diethyl ether has the greatest difference between the 100 and the zero. So it's considered most volatile which means it's most likely to increase in vapor pressure, while water is a lot less volatile, which is good for us, because water is very important for us. 
Um, so how we measure vapor pressure, um, we use a manometer, which is similar to the barometer that we looked at yesterday. Um, you have your, you have your um, gas right here, right? And you put it at a temperature. So here we have it at zero degrees Celsius. And we can see its, it's pressure here in this tube. As we heat this up and the pressure becomes greater, it pushes down on the tube, on the mercury in the tube. And when it does so, it raises it up here. And then you look at the difference between where it starts here and where it ends, and this change is going to tell us the pressure. Okay, so vapor pressure can be measured using the manometer that way, and that's how we got those numbers um, that we that we looked at here. Okay, so the vapor pressure is equal to the difference in the height of mercury between the two tubes, and just calibrate it. And you measure them, and that's how you can tell uh, the difference in vapor pressure. So in a sealed gas liquid system at the constant temperature, eventually, think of an answer, pause if you have to, correct answer, D, the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. Evaporation and condensation, all right, is, is what's going to happen, dynamic equilibrium at a constant temperature if it's sealed. All right, what conditions does boiling occur? Boiling happens, all right. When it has enough kinetic energy to vaporize, bubbles of vapor form throughout the liquid, rise to the surface, escape The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the pressure on the liquid, so the, the, the uh, atmospheric pressure on the liquid. Because the liquid boils and vapor pressure equal to external pressure, liquids don't always boil at the same temperature. Places where atmospheric pressure is lower, boiling points are lower, so higher altitudes, right? So atop Mount Everest, water boils at 70 degrees Celsius because the pressure above the liquid's a lot less than it is at sea level, where water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So that's huge to understand the difference in temperature. All right, water will boil at a lower temperature, which means you have to heat your noodles for your uh, mac and cheese a lot longer when you're in the mountains than when you're at sea level, because the water's not as hot when it boils. Um, so we can look at this graph to see how the uh, boiling point of a liquid is related to vapor pressure. At lower vapor pressure, right, we can see where it's at. But then once vapor pressure is here, all right, once vapor pressure equals one, one atmosphere, that's where we see the boiling point occurring. So we can see where chloroform, ethanol, water, and ethanolic acid boil. Boiling, again, is a cooling process similar to evaporation. It pulls heat out, all right? So although the vapor has the same average kinetic energy liquid, its potential energy is much higher. All right. So when you got steam coming up, that steam is really hot. So a burn from steam is more severe than one from boiling water, even though they are both at the same temperature, because the particles have a lot more energy as steam than they do as liquid, which we discussed previously. Um, normal boiling point is when it boils at one atmosphere or 101.3 kPa. And here are some common boiling points of several substances. Um, water, we're all aware of. These other ones are there. Uh, the boiling point. Of, so, is the boiling point of water at the top of Mount McKinley higher or lower than its Death Valley? Well, it's going to be lower because as water decreases, the boiling point is going to go down because altitude increases, pressure decreases. So, pressure decreases, boiling point also will go down. So, it's lower atop of the mountains than it is in the lowest point in the United States. Um, interplay between disruptive motions of particles in the liquid and the attraction among the particles of the physical properties of liquids during evaparation. All those molecules certain amount minimum kinetic energy can escape from the surface of the liquid. Just key concepts. You can look through those. Um, these are vocab words. Vaporization, evaporation, vapor pressure. This is shared with you in the document. Boiling point and normal boiling point. Again, two other terms we talked about. The end.